All right, what is up, guys? We should be live now on your feeds. I've got a great guest with me today. I'm actually very excited to have this particular guest on with me. And I just want to say before we get into this, um, you definitely want to go check his content out. Okay, I look at a lot of accounts. I consume a lot of content myself. I look at a lot of people and I checked out Paul's stuff. And honestly, I feel like he was a radio DJ in a past life. Maybe that was the case that your voice, your voice <laughs> is just made for radio. Not that you're not good looking because you definitely are, but your that voice. Was, was massively insulting. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> your voice is just amazing. Like that's what caught me. First of all, it was just the, the, the voice, the tonality, but the quality of the video that you produce too. And I think you have actually like a little um, PDF as well for, for trainers and coaches who want to learn about video marketing. I saw that in your in your bio as well. So go and grab that, guys. You can find it um, in Paul's bio on Instagram. Before we dive in, I want to give, you, give people a little bit of context as to who you are in a second. But I want to make sure people do check out your content because I just think it's awesome. And I love pointing people in the right direction when I find something good and, and your content is good. So what, what's your Instagram, first of all? So people who are listening to this can pull it up on, on their phone and have a look. Yeah, it's really straightforward. It's Paul underscore Standell, S-T-A-N-D-E-L-L. -L. There aren't many of us with that name, except for one person. And I actually think, because it used to be a different thing. I used to have a company ages ago called Body by Control. And I think my dad is actually the person with... Paul Standell without the underscore in it. So I probably need to have a word with my dad and be like, you don't even use Instagram. Because <laughs> I, I can't think of any other Paul Standells that I know. But yeah, that's that's uh, quite easily where you can find me. Amazing. We'll chuck that in the show notes as well. Someone said, where's the skeleton at, Paul? Where is the skeleton? So we've got some people in the crowd who know who you are, clearly. Here we go. There's, uh, there's always a skeleton nearby. It's over the other <laughs> side of the office. Uh <laughs> I love it. I love it. So we've got someone who is clearly seen the skeleton before and um, has seen your content, which is amazing. So for anyone who doesn't know who you are, give us a little bit of a, a backstory as to how you got into the industry and what you've been doing and what you currently do right now. So the backstory, I always want like a cool backstory and I can never really come up with one that sounds all that exciting. So I'm 34 and I've been in the industry since I was 22 or something like that. So a little while now. And in many senses, it's quite like plenty of other people's. I was moderately active as a kid, but not, not particularly mental. I was never like captain of the sports team, but I played a fair bunch of sport. And then at one point, I sort of stopped playing a bunch of sport, um, got a bit chunky. I had acne as a teenager, so it turns out being, being chunky with a bunch of spots on your face was doing nothing for my ability to track the opposite sex, and I had enough. Uh, and so I, everything I was trying didn't do anything to help my acne. So I was like, well, I can at least get myself in better shape. And so went to the gym. One thing led to another and, and that sort of escalated. And then at the same time, I have a performing background. I went to drama school. I trained as an actor. I went and did that for, for a good few years. And one of the things I was initially when I was getting into this industry 12 years ago was I wanted a job that I could do around auditioning. Uh, that I also enjoyed. I didn't want to work in call centers and waiting tables and all that shit anymore. I'd done plenty of waiting tables. And so I am denied between two jobs, driving instructor and PT. <laughs> and to this day, I'm infinitely glad and grateful that I picked PT because it's actually become a really fulfilling, rewarding and exciting career. I think once you get past the first few years of stuff, and I'm sure from what we've spoken about before, plenty of your audience will be familiar with the difficulty of the early years. Uh, so, you know, a couple of years then spent around acting stuff. Then I had some mental health problems. So it was all a bit of a shit show for the first few years of, of my career. And then really over the last bunch, uh, it has started to hopefully come together a little bit more. And I'm predominantly these days teach other trainers, biomechanics, um, coach people using biomechanics. I'm super excited about that type of thing. And also the other big facet, as you've already kind of touched on, is trying to take the skills that I learned through drama school and years of being on stage and in front of cameras, how to be better at doing that. Because certainly if you want to live in the online space, I think the, the most important thing that you need to know how to do is grab attention uh, and hold it. And, you know, you can do that in sleazy ways, but hopefully we want to do that in a way that is still you and because there are so many people who succeed online who have really different personalities. So it, it is about finding that cliched thing that is called your voice. And there is no good quick way of finding it other than trying a bunch of stuff, failing at some stuff, learning as you go and, and finding kind of what works for you along the way. Um, 
And yeah, I, I, I would like to think I can help people do that better than most given that background. So that's probably enough spiel about me before I bore myself with my own story. It all makes sense now as to like your ability to grab attention and deliver good content because in your not past life, but previous experience, you develop some skills there that are now actually showing up in this current version of you, which, which is interesting. It wouldn't, if you watch content from a few years ago, it wouldn't be. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm going to make so it. It wasn't, it wasn't very good then. <laughs> well, it, it's not the, you know, I would like to think my ability in front of a crowd or in front of an audience and when the, when the red light goes on is fine. But I didn't used to think about my content through any kind of business lens. I didn't really understand mm -hmm. talking to an audience. I wasn't clear on who I was talking to. And actually, I, I have a thing I call the, the first rule of attention is that you have to talk about something that the other person wants to hear about. Like, mm. I can be the most charismatic guy you've ever heard speak, but if I come on and I talk to you about the breeding habits of trout, like, you're probably not going to stick around. You might stick around for 10 seconds if I do it really engagingly in the first 10 seconds, but at some point, you'll stop caring. And so you can be dynamic and you can be engaging, and there's lots of great ways of thinking about content and content creation. But one of the first and most important parts is who you're talking to and do they care about the shit that you're presenting? So actually, if you go back and look at my older content, I might have been okay, but it wasn't well edited. It wasn't well thought out. It was missing plenty of stuff. So it might have the occasional thing that did all right, but it was still missing things. Before we dive into like becoming a better trainer, a better coach, mm. some of the stuff that you do with your, your clients inside the mentorship, inside the academy that you've got, I want to touch on the content creation process, first of all, because Obviously, sure. no one is going to care about getting better at coaching clients or training clients if they don't have any clients. And so <laughs> I think we might as well address getting clients and just touch on that briefly in terms of like your content creation process specifically, because I'm genuinely interested. One of the reasons why I do this, this podcast is to provide value to everyone that's listening, but also get insights myself. You know, I'm True. constantly a student. I don't think that I know everything because that's impossible. Um, and I know that there's always things to learn from other people. And I was just creating content myself right now, shooting videos, creating small clips, long clips, all that kind of stuff. And it, and it takes energy. It takes effort and it takes, mm -hmm. it takes practice. And you have to do your best to try and systemize it. Otherwise, it can kind of take over your business. But I'd be interested to know, like your personal content creation process just for video. Cause there's lots of different content you can create. Like, do you have like a process or you just show up and go, right, I need to do a video. Well, let's just record and see what happens. No, there's, there's, there's genuinely a bit of a process. Like I would say, and I think this is true of any creative endeavor. Sometimes it comes really quick and easy. And sometimes it's a bit more of a deliberate slog. I don't know anyone who doesn't find that, you know, sometimes the best bit of content you'll put out took you all of three seconds to make really. And it was kind of on the fly and it just resonated for who knows what reason. And then other times stuff that you're like, I think that's pretty good. It's going to go out, <laughs> doesn't do all that well. And you're like bollocks. Right. But so rather than just looking at the outlier bits of content, you know, what's your batting average is probably the more interesting part and what goes into that. And so um, for me, one of the most important things, and I think this is true of writing and, and anyone in any creative endeavor like I use just notes on my phone, but ideas will hit you from no good reason out of anywhere. And you will forget half of them if you don't write them down. Now, I used to just make a new note each time, but now I have like 7,000 notes on my phone and there's no way I'm looking back that far. So one of the first things I would say, just create one folder called content ideas or one note called content ideas. And whatever it is that's just jumped into your head, like scribble that crap down. And usually for me, that's just a bit of an idea. Now, some of it then has to be looked through, okay, is that a topic that I'm just interested in? Like I'm a history nerd, but it's hard for me to crowbar history into a fitness thing that frequently and have it kind of resonate. So I generally don't bother. Um, I found one piece of content once. I should probably recreate this because this is years ago. Of uh, One of the first ways of looking at the effects of fasting was uh, I think a, a Spanish king or, or a, no, not Spanish king. Frederick of Sicily did a thing where he got um, uh, like a prisoner or two prisoners, he fed one and he starved the other one. And then he got them to like run and escape before being like cut open and like murdered to see the effect of digestion <laughs> on whether or not activity, fasting and all this kind of shit made a difference. And so, you know, you, know, you can kind of find a, a leverage way in there. 
um, that might be vaguely interesting. I could probably, I'd have to go and have a quick look at that bit of content again and go, right, what's the story? How do I present this in an engaging and interesting manner? Um, but generally speaking, I go, well, history is not going to matter. What are my audience interested in? My audience are primarily PTs, PTs and online coaches, like 90 odd percent. And generally with a view to being great trainers through the use of biomechanics and anything vaguely related to coaching. So the first bits are, okay, I'm looking at bits of content through that lens. And these are sort of my pillars of content. So have I got breakdowns of exercises, things that people might not be doing, great analogies I've used with clients over the years, the way I approach coaching and whatever else is kind of going on. So a lot of it is that. Then let's say you've come up with, uh, you know, the idea, I'm just going to do uh, three way people love numbers, right? For no good reason. We really enjoy numbers. Uh, if I do a few different ways to improve your triceps extension, it never does as well as three top tips to improve your tricep extension. And it doesn't need to be three, by the way, come up with your tips, like figure out these are the solutions to the problem that I'm trying to solve for my audience. All right, I've got seven. Guess what I'm going to call it? Seven top tips. <laughs> if I've got four, I'll go with four fabulous. I don't care. I like to alliterate a lot because we're cheap and easy and words that begin with the same letter, we seem to go, oh, that sounds so much better. Like, Cool as a cucumber. Like the cucumbers aren't particularly renowned for being cool. We just start with a K. Curiosity killed the cat. All right. Dogs, if anything, are probably more curious. But no, we like stuff when it begins with the same letter. So you can use some of those things as a as an easy way in. But all right, I've got my idea. Okay, so we're gonna look at tricepy things. Then it's going, okay, does I think for Instagram at least, you haven't got that long to make an impact with things. So it needs to get to the fucking point, right? Like do less with it if needs be. So the opening bit is going to be sometimes the hardest thing to come up with because it's a headline. It's how do I grab your attention? And there's lots of different ways of doing that to grab you with some intrigue. This is the single best thing you've not been doing to, uh, right? Okay, right. Maybe it'll be enough to hook me in. Or as I said, we love numbers. And the more almost obscure the number, sometimes the more curious it becomes. 37.6% of people agree with this. <laughs> like, okay, that's a bit weird, right? I'll mm. probably follow on to the next bit. So some, I'll often start just with the topic and I'll, sometimes the headline hits you immediately and you're like, that's what I should call it. And then other times I'll write out the rest of it and come back to it and go, right, what's the, how, what's the opening hook of that? Like sometimes if I do a, uh, an exercise tutorial, it's as simple as going, this is the tricep extension, right? Or you don't have to make it super complicated. If, it, if it's perfect for your audience, you don't have to come up with the weirdest headline of all time just for it to, to kind of work. So sometimes we can overdo it, but topic, figure out the headline a little bit, go, okay, are these, I think most content online for short form stuff needs to either be immediately actionable or funny. <laughs> and if it's neither of those things, 97% of the time it can fuck off, right? Like if I don't give you something you can go and do and use or make you smile and laugh because this is an entertainment format primarily, I'm probably just jerking myself off and going like, oh, I enjoy this topic. Listen to me talk, right? And But that's not a particularly useful thing. So uh, have I got some very specific usable things? Cool. How do I package those? And then how do I say them in, in, in an interesting manner that is me? Like, I make plenty of dick jokes and uh, stupid sexual references because that is me. And if you have me on podcasts and stuff like that, I'm going to make the same kinds of jokes. Like, mm -hmm. A lot of people will try and mimic and copy. And I think that's inevitable when you're starting out because you don't know what your voice is yet. You know, oh, I like that person's content. But I don't know how to do it yet. So you're going to just sort of copy that. How often do you, we hear this for musicians? We hear it for comedians. It was certainly true for me as an actor. You, stop, you just copy <laughs> to begin with. And over time, start to go, okay, that feels like me. And that sort of doesn't. And this authenticity idea, it takes time. It takes practice. And it takes a bit of feedback and, and going okay, I thought that bit of content was pretty good. How did it do? You know, what's your save ratio like on it? How many likes are you getting? How many shares are you getting? What do you want out of that bit of content? I really like an idea of start with the end in mind, right? Like mm. with, what do I want my audience to do with this bit of content? Is this shareable? If you want something to be shareable, it needs to basically agree with something your audience already think and package it in a way that they wish they'd said so that they can share it with their audience and look smart to their audience. That's the key behind a share, right? It's either I do this series. I haven't done one for a while, but they're called fitness rants and fitness rants are just me over the top ranting, hopefully in a mildly humorous way uh, about various topics, whether that's CrossFit or bodybuilding or the liver King I could do one on, I suppose, or something kind of like that. And the whole idea with that, they get, they do very well for me and they get lots of shares. 
And the main reason for that is, oh, I, I've already been thinking that. I wish I'd said it that way. That's funny. My audience need to know that I think this. That's really what that is. Whereas if I Got make it. carousels or other bits of content that provide lots of value, loads of saves, right? So that thing for me is likely to transition more into my ability to sell biomechanics courses or coaching and that type of thing. Whereas shareable stuff is more about let's get eyeballs onto me. But I'm going in with, okay, does this piece of content, whatever it happens to, to look like and be, does it actually encourage the person consuming it to do the call to action I want at the end? And do it like, you know, if you're putting out this, this bit of content that has nothing to do with coaching and then you put a really weird, come get coaching with me. You're like, that's just, just a very strange segue. Um, so starting with the end in mind, being clear who you're talking to, thinking about how do I make this idea interesting and sound like me? Like, you know, if, if you're just copying someone else's analogies all the time, it won't sound like you. And it might mm. not be relevant to your audience, by the way. Like I speak to lots of coaches. If you don't talk to coaches, don't talk like me <laughs> necessarily, or at least how do I package this into the way that this person will understand? So the kind of process involves a, a, a bunch of stuff like that. And then as far as filming it goes, um, you know, I've wanted to do it. And for anyone who's listened, feel free to steal this. So I want to do a fitness. I did a fitness rant years ago on business mentors, right? And I wish I'd put this thing in at the start of, because we all know what it's like, right? Everyone's looking for five guys to do, <laughs> right? Yes, so I'm, the, five guys the idea of my, yeah, exactly. Right. I'm looking for five guys. And then I want to cut immediately to stood outside five guys, the restaurant and be like, fuck, I found it. <laughs> right. That was going to be the intro kind of thing for that. But that idea of going, what's the idea? What, the, what am I doing? And then if it's a video, can I present it visually? Can I have something change quite frequently? Like we have quite short attention spans. If nothing changes on your video every few seconds, you're probably going to be starting to lose people if you're not careful. And that can vary. That doesn't mean you need to, you know, zoom in, zoom out, have loads of noises going off. Like that can just be as simple as the emphasis and the enthusiasm that I put onto how I'm talking and what my delivery is like. It can be chucking a gif over the top of something while you continue to waffle under it. One of the biggest wins people can do for their video content is fucking edit it, right? Like, okay, I have a rule in my short form video stuff. If it wants to be quick and snappy, if there is a pause for me of more than 0.2 seconds in the audio, I cut it. So it goes bam, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Because people are watching this while taking a shit or like going through a bunch of different stuff. So it needs to be quite snappy. It needs to be to the point. Kill your babies. I know you like the way that you said that, but actually if it doesn't serve the purpose, if it's just repeating something that you said, if it's not that engaging or clear, murder it, <laughs> right? Get rid of it. It doesn't deserve to be in the piece. So planning that thing out, if it's video, the same rules apply with the content. Here's the idea. Here's the bullet points that I want to hit and cover. Maybe I riff on camera and just kind of look down and be like, right, I've got this thing on that bit. So I'm going to do, okay, that's the point. Right. I'll look towards the camera and go, introducing the, da, 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 da. all right, cool. If I didn't like the way that I did that take, I'll do it again. And I'll just leave the camera rolling because I'm going to edit that crap out. Like, Put a little bit of background music on, fade it right down, get some captions on there because most people read video, certainly on that thing. So there's lots of easy wins that you can start with to improve content. And everyone has their own little process. Um, and I'm confident I didn't completely answer your question all that well. I think you did. I think you like over answered it with lots of different ideas for anyone who's listening in the crowd. So like I heard the planning process, writing things down when they come to your minds, like putting mm -hmm. them in your notes. I do that, you know, when I go into um, or, or come into a, a situation or a scenario or something happens and I think, oh, I can link this to a teaching point that I'll just make a note of it. You know, like if something happens in my day-to-day -day life, you talked about making it engaging, using hooks, um, editing um, to actually hold attention, jump cuts. Um, and also like, you're going to be copying when you first begin mm. and when you first start making content, but through that process of copying, you're going to discover your own voice and you're going to find your own authenticity, which is then going to allow you to lean into that and um, ultimately build a business around what is true for you when it comes to your opinions, the value that you want to share and, and your, your little nuances as well as a content creator. But as you can probably tell, if you're listening to this, like you put a lot of thought into that content creation process because you've been doing it a long time. Yeah. Whereas if you're just starting, 
my recommendation to my clients is just create a video and post it, you know, yeah. just get, get going. Then yeah. from there, you can start getting sexy and technical and start adding these, these different elements to make it more engaging. So I'd love to shift gears now into um, really what you're doing with your, your trainers, with your coaches to actually help them in becoming better, better trainers and coaches. Yeah. Obviously biomechanics is, is your, your thing, right? It's your mm -hmm. gig. Why do you think biomechanics is a topic that's often overcomplicated, overcomplicated, poorly taught? Um, and why have you decided to focus on on teaching this to people? Like, why are you trying to fill that gap? So for the first part, I think, it's like, what is biomechanics? So biomechanics is just forces applied to anatomy. That's the best way of thinking about it. And if you define it that way, which you should, <laughs> then what you will realize is that describes everything to do with training that you can possibly imagine. So whether it's Pilates or bodybuilding or CrossFit or wanking alone in your room, right? It's all technically biomechanical processes that are leading to the, <laughs> to the outcomes of every one of those processes. You right? said that, not me. Like yep, you said yep, that, not I'll me. Stand by it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so if we, the, the job title is personal trainer. Like the primary thing that we are hired for the vast majority of the time is related to training. Obviously, there's all this nutrition stuff, and it depends on what you specialize in and all that jazz. But most coaches are going to start on gym floors. And I think most coaches should start on gym floors, by the way. I think it's way easier to grow a successful in-person business than an online business in time terms, right? Like Agreed. longer term, you've got more scope online to grow a successful business. But mm -hmm. like as, a, as an on-the-floor trainer, I can have and have plenty of experience of picking up a client within five minutes of talking to them. That has never once happened online ever. No one within five minutes of following me has ever bought coaching from me. It doesn't happen. The lead time on that stuff is a lot longer and the competition is higher. So I think it benefits you, if you want a successful career, to start out on the gym floor, build your skill set, have a place where you, you're likely to succeed faster and easier um, on the gym floor. So, well, if you're on the gym floor, again, you're primarily hired for training. And then there's, there's all this fat loss stuff. And so you're going to need some behavior change and some psych and some nutrition stuff. Absolutely. But if I was trying to get a new client, one of the first things I could do is ah, oh, we'll start chatting on the floor. And then they're doing this exercise. I can give them a little tip that I understand from my biomechanics shit that oh, if I just do this, or if I move that there, if I get that person with that structure to hinge over and move their arm in the end, oh, suddenly this experience of training is really different for them. And experience is the great persuader right? Like words and all that stuff are gravy. But if I can give you an experience in your quad that you've never had before on a leg extension, even though you've been training for years, that means more to the buy-in than a million words, right? So one of the things that biomechanics starts to allow us to do is to manipulate training, to understand training. Who is this useful for? Is this exercise appropriate for you know, Deirdre in front of me with her knee replacement. Is this genuinely the best way of getting the most out of this machine for this guy who wants to grow his arms or this girl who wants to grow her glutes? Like what little tweaks? Why do I say drag the feet back on that? Why don't I want the shin to move? Should the shoulder flex in a bicep curl? Why is the answer yes for some people and no for others? Like when we start seeing exercise, what we're really seeing is a bunch of forces that are being applied to anatomy, but those forces are annoyingly invisible. And yet they're not if you know what to look for. If you can see the line of force that comes off a dumbbell as it wants to descend towards the floor because gravity is always gravity and it's always trying to go straight down to the floor. So we've got this thing, like it took me, I was, I don't know, I've been a PT something like eight years uh, before I, <laughs> I could answer this question and it struck me as a, as a failure on my part. Like why is the dumbbell lat raise hardest when your arm is out 90 degrees to the side versus when it's resting by your side, because it self evidently is anyone who's ever done it knows that it's harder when their arm is. And if you're not sure, by the way, just do it, stick your arm out to the side at 90 degrees, see how long you can hold it there. And it'll start shaking versus the one that's held by your side. I'm like, well, was it, is the dumbbell heavier? Let's say I'm holding five kilos. Well, it's five kilos when it's down by my side in my hand. Is it not five kilos when it's out to the side? No, it's, it's clearly still five kilos. So, Gravity hasn't changed and the, the load hasn't changed. Why is it harder? And I couldn't answer this question. It wasn't taught in any of my level two or three. I'd spent years going on courses by Eric Helms and Alan Aragon and everything that was under the, 
the um, exercise science field over the last sort of 10 years. I hadn't skimped on research. I had coaches myself. And this struck me as a massive failing that I couldn't answer this question as to why. And the, the answer, if you're curious as to this thing, is to do with leverage. We call it a moment arm, but a moment arm is just a description of leverage. So if your arm is out to the side and you bend it to 90 degrees and so shorten the length of your arm, it becomes easier. If I straighten my arm all the way back out, it gets harder again. If you think of it in terms of a door, a door works around a hinge. The handle for the door is placed at the end of the door, not right next to the hinge, because putting it right next to the hinge would be shit leverage. And you'd be like, this is way harder to open the door than it needs to be. Let's put it at the end of the door. The reason a crowbar is useful, you don't use the small end of the crowbar to do the crowbarring. You hold the far end of it and, and lever it. If you're on a seesaw, the further you go out on the seesaw, the more you bend the seesaw. The closer in you get, the less you do it. These are the, the physical realities that underpin exercise and understanding how to manipulate them and what's going on and then how that meets your client's anatomy, physiology, their goals and preferences and everything else was just for me this really super exciting area that after having been a trainer for a while, and I'll be honest, starting to lose a little bit of enthusiasm and excitement about it because I was like, all the answers were kind of the same. I was like, oh, calorie deficit. We need to do this. And we've got to find a way for my client to stick to these things. All that stuff is true. But, you know, when you've been doing it for a long time and not having to, in some sense, I found I'm a big nerd, right? If that hasn't come across yet, right, then one thing you should know about me, I'm a big nerd. And I like to feel intellectually engaged in something. And this was a field where suddenly I was curious and I could start exploring answers. And I could also get some answers. Like one of the annoying parts of <laughs> lots of the fitness industry are these gray, it depends answers, which is true. It does depend. There's no getting around that, right? But it was nice sometimes to have a very clear cut answer, which is this is harder there. That is easier there. This is why. And I could even do an equation on it and I could have a clear cut answer exactly how much easier and, and better it, it kind of was. And for me, that became just super exciting. Then using it started to really change the client experiences I could create and some of the you know it, it's not like people hadn't been getting in great shape before the, the biomechanics movement started coming into to, into B and that's again because before biomechanics was a thing it was still a thing right it's not like back in the day well there were no forces being applied to anatomy before anyone knew the term lever arm moment arm force angle this and the other it's like no that's that's bollocks like it clearly is always been at play understanding it in more detail just gives you more tools for your toolbox. So, you know, squat, bench, and deadlift are great exercises for plenty of people. And then for others, they're shit, right? My shoulders always ache and burn when I was benching, but I was always of the opinion that's what you had to do for a chest. And so it didn't matter that every time I got up to like 110, 120 on my bench press, my, the front of my shoulder burned. Oh, it sucked, right? But that's, that's what I had to do. So I just kept kind of going. Same as squatting. I'm pretty well suited to, to deadlifting, but squatting, I'm all long and gangly. I'm like some kind of giraffe human. And that I was, but I have to squat. And again, every time I get above 140, my hips would just start aching and my low back would start aching. But that didn't matter because everyone was crowbarred into this same thing and there was no other way of looking at it. And I didn't know another way of looking at it. And so biomechanics improved the toolbox, improved my understanding of going, oh, it's useful for these guys, but not for these guys. Or I can, this can be perfectly fine for these people, provided I just manipulate it like this, um, that little bit. And that was just this whole world uh, opened up. And then I guess one thing really led to another. Sometimes when you find something you're passionate about, that takes you quite a long way because you're like, oh, I'll, I'm not going to shut the fuck up about, about this thing that I'm excited uh, for. And that, you know, hopefully I can explain well and, and teach to other people and have it make it, you know, even half the impact it's made on my career is would be amazing like i could shave off quite comfortably six years of my career um by having better mentors sooner by learning biomechanics sooner by you know maybe not having some mental health problems and some <laughs> some other shit that was kind of in there but this stuff would be just such a godsend if i was starting my career again and it's not like you know i don't regret any of that stuff everything leads you to where it leads you and i didn't murder anyone along the way so i don't have anything that's a huge regret but i could definitely have got here a lot quicker and had a way more successful maybe uh, way more rewarding business by learning some of these things a little sooner 
hopefully that gives enough of an answer there. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing. And um, I want to kind of shift into getting your perspective um, really with the online space, okay? Because there's going to be some trainers listening to this. They understand the, the benefit of everything that you just mentioned. Um, but when you go online, there may be some perceived limitations in the ability to be, be able to coach clients, watch their form, get them doing the exercises correctly, right? It's a common it's a common thought process that people come to me with, right? How am I going to be able to do this online? Sure. How am I going to be able to keep clients um, in check and, and, and check their form and all that kind of stuff? So you've clearly come into the same scenario and line of questioning from trainers before. And so what do they need to consider when going online and any advice there? Yeah, it, it, look, I mean, the, one of the first things I think we have to accept the limitations of the medium and go, you can't assess it as well online <laughs> as you can in person. And, you know, anyone saying that you can is lying, <laughs> but that doesn't mean we can't improve what we do online, right? Like in person, I can assess the ranges of motion that you've got in various joints. I can get hands on. I can check whether there's a difference between what we call an active and a passive range and whether we can close the gap. I can check an exercise specific range of motion that I want this person to use. All of that stuff. I can just move myself around. I don't have to ask for a different camera angle. I just wander, <laughs> right? I can poke, I can prod, I can give you a cue in real time and see whether it worked, whether it landed. Online, none of that is, <laughs> is possible in real time. So the first bit is we have to accept the limitations and then work smartly around them in the best way that we can. So some of the first bits are, okay, well, where's my client currently at? How much experience have they got with training? And the only way of me verifying their form is video feedback. That's the only way. Them describing it ain't going to work, <laughs> right? Uh, my elbow went to here and then they, you know, they ain't going to picture that, right? Get a video. So, well, then first off, who is your audience? Like if you're dealing with bodybuilders, they will have no qualms whatsoever in filming themselves and you'll be fine. They'll start posing at the end of it. It'll be great, right? But if you're dealing with some newbies who are trying to lose a bunch of weight, you know, They've done Weight Watchers a whole bunch of times. They're not confident in the gym yet. Asking them to film themselves might be a big ask. Just getting them to go might be a win, in which case, you know, do, how do we start to work around that? Well, the first thing is we're not dictators, so I need to ask them, could you film this for me? And here's why I would like to do that. I want to make sure that you're actually doing this exercise the best way that you possibly can so you can get the most out of this thing. But we're online. The only way I'm going to do that is if you can get some footage. Now, it might be a bit weird. So maybe we just start by filming a couple of these ones that you can do in a corner of the gym, right? Where there's no one else kicking around. So, you know, we go and we just look at a dumbbell lat raise or a body weight split squat or something where I don't need them to set a tripod up in front of the busiest part of the gym and start filming these things. So some of that is just client interaction and, you know, being a good coach. Then it's going, all right, I don't have the ability to provide you with cues in real time and correct you in real time. And so I should start probably more simply than I think that I might if this was an in-person person, right? Because I have no idea what this thing is gonna look like. So I might start with some things that are more maybe machine-based, uh, less compoundy, less complex, all things being equal than if I have someone in person where I'd be like, yeah, I can show them how to work that machine, that's fine, right? So perhaps we start with rather than getting them to, you know, uh, but I really want to do this cuff lat raise thing. Now, if someone comes and they really want to do that, then we should give them it because they just asked for it, right? But if they haven't asked for any of that stuff, maybe I don't start doing the weird, quote unquote, biomechanics thing and getting into band machines and sticking cuffs on and putting a gimp mask on. Maybe <laughs> I just get them to do the standard stuff, but provide some solutions for it. So they're doing, they've done dumbbell lat raises, most likely. So, all right, all I'm going to get them to do is hinge forward 20 degrees-ish, and I'll get video feedback on this to confirm because that actually lines up the middle delt for most people slightly better as they go through their lat raise than if they're bolt upright. When people are bolt upright, they tend to allow, um, the arm naturally has to allow some external rotation as it comes up to the side. But that means mm -hmm. that the anterior delt is better aligned with the, the line that the resistance is running along straight down uh, in order to fight it. Well, the lat raise is a middle delt exercise. Pet peeve. It's not medial delt. Medial means toward the midline of. This is actually the lateral. It's further out than all the others. So technically, it's a middle if you want to call it anything. But that's just me being a nerdy dickhead, right? It doesn't really matter. And I don't really care too much if you say medial, right? But the middle head of the delt, 
Okay, so let's hinge over and do that. Well, what else can I do? Well, I know that if I launch this dumbbell, I actually make it lighter because forces aren't static. If you're not sure about this, you can get a luggage scale and move it around at different speeds and see how the force on the luggage scale changes. Forces aren't static. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to go a little slower. I'm going to get them to slow this thing down. There's no torque demand. There's no real challenge in a dumbbell lat raise when your arm is right down by your side, particularly, right? And that's why you can hold a 30 kilo down by your side, but you can't do a lat raise with a 30 kilo, right? There's no challenge for the delt down at the bottom. Well, what if I hack off then? I'm just going to take off the bottom third of the range where it's really easy. And I just get this person hinged over 20 degrees, slowing it down, pausing at the top and the bottom, and having taken off the bottom third. Suddenly, I've transformed the way the dumbbell lat raise feels for that person in a way that feels much more targeted in the muscle. And that experience is like, ooh, okay, maybe that was good. I'm glad I sent Paul this video now because the things he gave me to do with it led to a clearly uh, different experience than if I hadn't done those things. So I tend to prefer starting with quote unquote simpler exercises and solving those with tempo and control and range of motion first. Mm. And by the way, here's a really simple one. Every one of your clients <laughs> almost will move way quicker than you mean them to move. So let's say I wrote a tempo of, for the fuck a bit for this, three, one, three, one. That means three seconds on the eccentric, a pause at the end of that, three seconds on the concentric, pause at the end of that. Here's what you do when they send you their video, right? You click play on their check-in and you sit there and you go, three, two, one, pause, three, two, one, pause. Why have you done seven reps when I've counted one, right? Because that's almost universally what always happens with that. And that's an easy way to then be like, slow the fuck down, <laughs> right? And then they're going to slow down. And then, then when they slow it down, they're like, oh my God, I had to use way less weight to do that. That was way harder. And it, okay, sweet, cool. Now, by the way, we don't always have to move slowly, but if we're trying to get people to change some of the intention that they're using, change their focus, pay attention to actually deliberate movements, well, when they start, boom, exploding things, good luck thinking when you're doing a kettlebell swing. Like, you, there's no thinking time. It's a snap. That's like trying to think when you throw a tennis ball. You think before you throw the tennis ball, and then you think after you threw the tennis ball. There's no thinking during the tennis ball throw, right? So if you're trying to correct stuff, you can't do that when people are moving rapidly. So when starting out with a new client, I make things slower than normal. And I steal a lovely idea from Greg over at Lift the Bar. If you guys don't know Lift the Bar, check out Lift the Bar. Uh, and he called it, and I use this with in-person people too, and it's musical statues. So musical statues with someone is, at any point, if I say stop, you should be able to stop and own that shape. So we go, okay, go. And they start doing the rep. Stop, go, stop, go, stop, go, stop, right? You just play a game with them, right? And they're paying a lot of attention. And But again, it doesn't work if they're doing explosive shit, so no shit, right? But if we're dealing with beginners and they're starting out and we just want to see control, the idea of musical statues and being able to stop and own that shape at any point is huge. So then again, we can go through some more specifics for um, what range of motion is appropriate for them on that thing then you'll need to know how to tell them. Here's how you test that. You might get a video back on that. And also as, a, as an online coach, so I limit clients to five videos per week because otherwise you will be sent people who, <laughs> who will send you 30 videos to look at and their mm -hmm. check-in will take eight years and they won't remember half of what you told them because you're going to be providing solutions to what you're seeing in front of you if, you, if they need solutions. But Curious. they're not going to implement. Chris, before yeah. you dive on, why did you select five? Why five? There's no hard fucking, like, I mean, you could have selected. <laughs> I'm just it, curious. No, 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 it's, a, it's a good question. I think five to me just always struck me as a nice round number. <laughs> One <laughs> On for each day of the working week? Yeah, but <laughs> I'd like to say it was that conscious, but it wasn't, I'll be honest. Okay. Was like, oh, but five is five is a good good amount to get enough, but not receive too much. Yeah. Because like you said, you don't want to overwhelm the client with feedback and tasks yeah. and And that's, tweaks. you know, I... I don't know that I die on that hill of saying that five is definitively the right amount. Like you could definitely have a couple more than that or mm -hmm. maybe one. I think less than that. Sometimes, by the way, clients will only send you like two or three. So up to five is, is still kind of fine. But yeah. absolutely, they're not, you know, they watch their check-in on whatever day they get their check-in from you. But they might not be doing that exercise for another three or four days. Well, good luck remembering more than a few things on each of those movements. So again, if you've given them complicated stuff and then you're having to correct lots of things, you probably need to regress it for most clients online. If you're having to correct like four things, mm, that's way too many, at least to begin with. Now, that doesn't mean you have to, everything has to be inch perfect and 
you know, overcoached, it doesn't provide one thing at a time, move it in the right direction. So one of the first things I do for most people is control the tempo. When we can control the tempo, then I can get you to start thinking during this about different things that I want to introduce you to as you're going through it. Then we might start speeding up. I might want those forces to be faster. I might want the increased motor unit recruitment that comes when we move things faster. Yeah, that's all true, but it's all still contingent on you owning this exercise first. So let's slow it down. Then let's like one to two cues or solutions per thing that you've seen. Any more than that, they ain't going to remember it unless there's some kind of savant figure, in which case have at it, right? <laughs> but for the most part, one or two, give them that because you're not going to see if it had the impact that you wanted it to have for another week, most mm -hmm. likely. Mm -hmm. And again, I think this comes back to having worked on the gym floor. Like the more you do actual in-person coaching and the more experience you've got there, the more things you have in your locker that you can try saying or doing uh, to help solve the problem in front of you. Like a cue is there to solve a problem. Lots of people, especially when they're starting out, have just read cues that they've heard other people write down or say. So it's chest up, it's screw the feet into the floor. And I've, I've said all of these ones, right? And there's nothing necessarily wrong with them. But here's the rule. If you say a cue more than three times and it doesn't solve the thing that you want it to solve in front of you, shut the fuck up. <laughs> it's not helping. You're just saying words and filling space. So the first part of a cue is, okay, I have this idea of what I want to see. Is the thing in front of me living up to that? If no, what do I need to say or do to help close the gap? And the idea that you have in mind might help close that gap. But if it doesn't, shush, <laughs> come up with another thing. Now, sometimes that might mean getting hands on. Sometimes it might mean regressing the exercise. Sometimes it's just changing the focus. Some words work better for other people than others. Sometimes here's a nice one. If you're again, in person doesn't help so much online, but get them to say the thing back to you. So demo it, what you want them to do, and then demo what they were doing, and then ask them to describe what they saw as the difference. Hmm and start using their words as a way back to them because that's giving you a bit of an insight. But again, online, you're limited by all those things and you have to know that. So simplify and then build out uh, from there. And then don't be afraid to ask once you've got people doing this for different camera angles, right? I want to see that knee alignment to the axis of the machine on the leg extension. And I want to see it from the side because I can see what's going on there. But I also might want to see down the barrel of the thigh because I want to see, do those legs kick out to the side at all and they're not aligned that well with the plane that the, the machine moves through, in which case, actually, we could line that up a little bit better for them. Um, so if you're getting, once you've got that, start asking for some extra Camry things if you need it. Don't think that, by the way, feedback sometimes is also about what they're doing well. So I really like that you've done this. That's You're doing that really well. You're holding that perfectly. Okay, now just try this for me. Like, There's lots of different ways. Or actually, do you know what, dude? You're nailing that one. I don't need to see that for a little while now. Show me something else next time. All of those things are, are, are fine. Got it. Love it. Some really good insights there. Hopefully people are listening to this and having some light bulbs when it comes to training their clients online, uh, but also in person. Both things that you shared there are very applicable for both in-person and online clients. And I think the key thing is, is having that understanding that there is some limitations when it comes to the online element and just being okay with that. But working around it the best you can in order to be able to to get those client results and like you said keeping it simple um as, as possible you know like simplify the process yeah i mean i think one of the other the big stuff is you know checking in with clients about so i have within my um training sheet you know there's a there's a column in or two columns in there that at the end <clears throat> they can fill it in i tell them not to fill it in until they've done the program for a couple of weeks but they ask them how well do you connect with this exercise one to five mm -hmm. One is shit, it gives it a red thing. Five is goes green, right? And then there's just a traffic light system in between those things. And then how much do you like this exercise is the column next to it. And it goes love, like, meh, hate, right? And then from whatever they put in that, it populates another uh, table for me where I can go, sweet. I can immediately see the exercise they love and the exercise they get a great connection with, the exercise they like, the exercise they have got good connection with, but not a great one, the exercise that they hate and all that kind of stuff. And as I continue to write their programs and you use, I use a phase feedback form. So we're obviously getting feedback every week on what's going well, what they're liking, et cetera. But as I'm collecting data and at the end of a thing, I will send them a whole new little uh, feedback thing, which is how well did this, this phase work for you? Was the volume about right? Did we find uh, too much for this, too little for that? Did you like anything? Are you bored of this? Any favorite exercises? Anything you want to work on in this next bit? Are we sure of what the goals are at this point? 
How well listened to do you feel? Like, am I actually listening to that person and checking in? Is there any way I could improve that for you? Blah, 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 blah. And then when we're writing that next program, I should 100% be using the exercises that they love and they have a good connection with. And any exercise that's generally, unless there's an amazing reason to keep it in, that they think is meh or hate, can fuck off. I don't care if it's a great exercise and the one that you love. If the client doesn't love it, piss off. Get it out of there, right? You're their coach. They're in charge, not you, right? This isn't a dictatorship. Your client can sack you. So like, make sure you're listening to them and providing them with that. So yes, some of it is how do we make these exercises the best for that person? But am I remembering that there is a person on the other end of this? You know, I'm reminded when I first started getting into to biomechanics, I had this old client, Chris, been a client of mine for years and years. And uh, <laughs> I was getting into biomechanics and I was learning how to, you know, make every rep really hard, right? Everywhere. There was no nice part of the rep. Everything was a grind and suffering. And I'm manually um, manipulating this machine. I'm hanging off it in bits of places. I'm assisting in others. Like, feels amazing if you really want to burn the crap out of a muscle and, and create an amazing experience. But I remember Chris saying to me at one point, she's like, Paul, it's a couple of months into doing this. I'm just not enjoying the sessions as much as I used to. Like every rep is so hard. And I went, ah, <laughs> Too much. I'm projecting what I love onto mm -hmm. this person at this point. But they've been a client for like six years at that stage. Clearly, they already liked what we were doing. I didn't need to overhaul it. I could have drip fed bits in and mm -hmm. not done that. So makes sense. Checking in is huge. Awesome. Um, hopefully everyone got a lot of value from this. If you did smash that like button on social media. And if anyone wanted to find out more about what it is that you do, what it is you offer, how you help trainers, you know, on a professional level, because I know you've got your, your mentorship program and services. Well, what's the best way to learn about that? Yeah. So if you, again, find us on Instagram. So either myself, Paul Standell, uh, you can find me pretty simply. Me and my friend Jimbo, you can find him at uh, James Sutton. Just search for that, James Sutton Coaching. Um, we run a company called the PT Project. And the whole point of the PT Project is to make PTs better at the skill set of being trainers and online coaches, primarily, certainly initially, at least through biomechanics. So we've just launched literally, don't know what day this comes out, but we launched on the 29th of August an announcement for our first online mentorship, which is a six week accelerated course, accelerated because it was initially 12 weeks and we thought no one wants to be learning over Christmas. So it starts in November. So we condensed it down to six weeks three calls a week, two structured ones where this is, these are the topics. You can see what the topics are. If you go onto my page, go in the link in the bio and click the, the, the online mentorship link that you'll see within there. You'll see what the curriculum is. And then there's also a call each week, which is just completely open form uh, where we can come in, ask any questions that you're curious about anything that you want some more answers on. Uh, and me and Jimbo can, can provide some of that stuff for you as well. We also offer, um, although they're all sold out currently, but you will see some dates coming very soon for our in-person education. When it comes to biomechanics, online is great and it'll get you up to speed with lots of things and it'll make you excited about stuff. But there is a point where you have to get hands on. You have to experience some of this stuff uh, from people who are good at it. And so we have a, a one day event that's called Breaking Down Biomechanics, which is really aimed at people who have no background they have never heard none of it and by the end of it going oh, i get that that's really exciting and having a like a bunch of really immediately applicable and usable things to take away from that we have a uh, another thing called a the, the hypertrophy project which is in a couple of weeks uh, and that is uh, i think there's actually one space left on that it's basically sold out uh, that is a two-day training event little bits of education but it's mainly about experiencing putting all this stuff into action and going holy shit I can't feel my legs anymore or whatever else is we've got across the, uh, the, the two days within that. I, let me I'll also wrap up. The, the online mentorship thing is also with the view of you can come knowing nothing about biomechanics for that thing. If you're just excited, you want to kind of know more. The whole point, similar to the one day, is that we would introduce someone who doesn't know a damn thing and then work them forwards from that point because we didn't know a damn thing about any of this. And we've been trainers for years by the time we, we came uh, across this. So there's absolutely no shame about that. We're really excited about those things. With the mentorship, it just takes you further than you, we can hope to take you in a day because obviously, right, it, it gives you that. So search for the PT project. Check myself out, Paul Standell. Check Jimbo out at James Sutton. Any questions or anything, slide in the DMs. Uh, send us a message. Drop us an email, paul at thepersonaltrainerproject.com. Uh, they're the best ways of getting hold of us amazing appreciate you so much for coming on hopefully everyone enjoyed it and got some value from this and the link to your instagram will be um, in the show notes so if you want to go and find that easily 
uh, just click on it and check out all those resources. See you guys very soon. Cheers, Paul. Cheers, buddy.